for you guys online, I'm messing with my life. So if y'all can come, if you have a standing invitation to come join us in person, you can watch. And don't don't feel sorry for her though, because she gives me back uh, more than I give her. But welcome, guys. Happy Easter. Glad you guys are here today. I, I know that we'll have some more that are going to trickle in here. That's all right. That's uh, what we're used to. But let me give let me give a shout out. How are you doing? Let me give a shout out to the ones that checked in last week. Um, Paula Stewart, Josh and Jen, Aaron, David, Joe, and Z uh, Kelly Zachary. Thank y'all for checking in. Let us know you're there. If you got prayer requests or comments, please put those things on there. Love to see your names pop up. Okay. Run through a few quick announcements. Maybe. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, and I need the, I need the bottle. Okay, I took the caption off. 
on this one because uh, anybody ever seen this around here? Y'all know what this is? No, they have this know. probably even in San Antonio. Y'all know what this is too? What is that? It's uh, text dot working. Right. So let me apologize. Anybody here works for text text dot? But this is like, <laughs> really hilarious. Here's the, what the caption says: Scientists are saying that the sun will burn out in seven billion years. That means text dot will have to finish road construction in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, apologies to me why it works for tech, text on. Okay, um, what did the horse say after it tripped? Help, I've fallen and I can't get any up. <laughs> Boy, that was a mixed reaction. No, no, no. What do you call a well balanced horse? Stay. <laughs> okay, you guys might need to know this. Uh, we used to have angry birds, now we've got angry carrots. What do you call an angry carrot? That would be a steamed vegetable. <laughs> What's the difference between a poorly dressed man on a tricycle and a well dressed man on a bicycle? The bicycle. The tire. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll end with this one. What's red and bad for your teeth? A brick. A brick, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, so today, Bible study at the Keys House, 5 o'clock, uh, potluck, and deep dive into the lessons. All are invited. Uh, they're sitting right there, so if you guys need an address, uh, ask them. They might even let you attend, particularly if you bring green bean casserole, because that's what we do. All right, Bible studies as well. The Titus Men's Group still little Mikey? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, how close are y'all to wrapping up? And after you wrap, I'm putting Mike on the spot. He didn't know I was going to ask this. After you wrap up, are y'all continuing into another book? Yet? I don't think we've ever discussed. We haven't discussed another book yet. I think the idea is to keep it going. Keep it going. Yeah, there will be no gaps. But we that, have to second book. that would be a good idea, gentlemen. But so, I, what I will say is it's supposed to be from 6:30 to 7:30. Yeah, y'all go till about nine. 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 You walk out. <laughs> <after hours. laughs> I, I've seen that y'all walk yeah. out here in our rehearsal, so y'all, yeah. I get in trouble if I do that. I just want y'all to know that. Okay, so uh, two opportunities for Bible study on Wednesday nights. The men's group are still in the book of Titus, uh, and so uh, come bring a pack of lunch, basically. You're going to be in there a little bit, but that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. If I had that opportunity, and I didn't think Charles would come in there and have me arrested for going in the rehearsal time, uh, we would be going later as well because we've been getting through about uh, two, three verses tops in First Peter. Uh, we're almost to chapter four of First Peter, and we're going to jump into Second uh, Peter. But you guys have a standing invitation to join us Wednesday nights, six thirty. The men's group meets in uh, Doug's class in the front foyer. Uh, our Bible study meets in the choir room in the back of the building as well. Six thirty. It is broadcast as well. If you can't join us in person. Okay, uh, prayer request. Uh, I've mentioned Karen. She had a death in the family. So if you, if you guys could uh, pray for her. Um, Alice and Kathy and Angela still do, dealing with, um, with health <coughs> issues, continuing things. So prayers that medication and therapy and all the things that will take place will take place. Kathy's next. Ablation is set for April 10th. Don't hold me to that day. Yes, I think that's right. the date. Um, but uh, we're, we still don't know if the first one worked or not quite. Okay. There's some relief. But uh, every day is an adventure, so continue to pray for, for her. Um, strange man sneaking in the back room. Pastor, are you distilling coffee, or would you like to say hi to everybody? Hi to everybody, but I'm <laughs> distilling coffee. Okay. <laughs> Do you guys have a prayer request? My nephew mm -hmm. normally comes. He's got a, a job opportunity that may come his way that he's applying for that we're praying about. You know, if it be the right thing for him, that's uh, As long as it's around here, we'll, we'll definitely. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll pray for David. You guys, you guys know Damon. If you didn't know a little bit about his background story, as a kid, he came to um, Faith, Builders. Faith Builders on Thursday nights. And so Tuesday. once he got Tuesday, sorry. <laughs> Hey, that's, that's why she's here. I need all the help I can get. Uh, but uh, once he grew up and got on his own and he was looking for God, this was the place that he came back to. This was the place he was familiar. And he's got plugged in, and it's awesome to see. And he is trying to pass that along to his kiddo as well. So prayers for David for a possible job.
different than the one he has. Uh, I would just like to pray for uh, my dealership. I went into my third month. It's a, still an amazing opportunity, but I'm noticing that there's a lot of uh, negativity, and it's causing, it's hampering my success in presenting uh, sales and stuff. Uh, it got a little heated yesterday with several women, including management. So I just pray for peace and, and understanding so that we can continue to be successful. Isaac, we don't we don't have to uh, be afraid of this, but uh, as the believer, the only source of peace we're going to run into is our Lord. And uh, every place that we go into is usually lacking that peace. And so uh, part of our prayers will be that you can be the right witness, not necessarily what you say, but what you do. Yeah. And that God will take and use that because that's the way he does, particularly with us grown-ups, that we need all the help we can get. He puts other believers in, in our path, and the Holy Spirit absolutely uses that. But that's an awesome prayer request. Others? Brandon? Dealing with some sort of a sickness again, um, been nauseous since last week, no more <coughs> anger or anything like that, but insides are a wreck and stuff like that, so just that could either be healed or God would point me in the right direction of what to do next. And it, tell me again, that, that's you? That's me. That's you, okay. Yeah, Scott is sick this morning too. Oh. Angela still has her stomach issues as well. You missed the trumpet of Jesus. All right. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you've done. Thank you for the fact that uh, the tomb is empty. And that's the entire reason that we are not wasting our time this morning. That's the entire reason that we come to worship you this morning and praise you for what you've done. Because as Paul's going to tell us today, um, your resurrection does something for us. It ensures our resurrection. And uh, Father, I'm so thankful that the things that we go through in this life, um, the lack of peace, the lack of, of health, oftentimes the, uh, the lack of hope, everything that the world gives uh, and tries to pile on, Lord, um, I'm so thankful that this is not our best life now. And uh, there is something beyond what we can describe, what we can even imagine. It's beyond our imagination. I'm so thankful, Lord, that this is not what we have to look forward to. And, Father, thank you for that, that message and thank you for that good news. And that's what Paul is going to talk about today because we need it just as much today as the Corinthian church needed it then. And, Father, the same things they wrestle with, we wrestle with. And I'm so thankful that you're the same today and tomorrow. You do not change. And so we can bring prayer requests like uh, job opportunities for Damon. We can ask for peace in Isaac's workplace. We can ask for healing for, for Brandon and uh, for Angela and Alice and Kathy and, and so many others that are in this room, Lord, that you know are dealing with things. And as always, Father, we're so thankful that long before I ever asked or learned of things like Karen's uh, aunt passing away, those were things that were well planned out in advance, and you had already prepared the way, and you were already there with them, and you're going to be with them through that. And I'm thankful that literally the final enemy that will be done away with is death. And then at that time, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more tears, no more weakness in us because we will be made completely. Thank you, Lord, for the hope we have in your message. I actually bless these people. It's in your name. Amen. <laughs> Alright, so speaking to Damon, there he is. We just prayed for you, sir, so pray about that job. Um, we're going to take a break from where we are in Timothy. We're going to jump into 1 Corinthians 15 for this particular chapter, for this particular Sunday, for Easter Sunday. Um, one of the things, this is going to shock you, but you're all sitting down. Um, the Corinthian church was riddled with problems. Obviously, they're the only church that ever existed that had problems, right? Yep. And so uh, Paul wrote just to them, and I'm thankful.
thankful that at Faith Baptist and uh, for uh, other churches that are represented here today, uh, we don't have to worry about any of these problems. And so we can read this and know that I'm thankful that this is not where I'm at. No, this message today is one about the Lord being risen. But he is trying to adjust behavioral and doctrinal issues that are associated with this particular church. And I'm struck by the fact that oftentimes Paul uses the phrase, he says, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. And most of the time when he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about something, guess what? It's usually because they and we are ignorant about the things that he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about. But he wants to correct this one, that the Lord is risen. Why, why, why does that matter? Why is that topic so important? Why do we have to get this right? Y'all tell me. Anybody? Truth matters. It's the foundation. Truth matters. It's the foundation. Here's the thing. If Jesus is still in that tomb, we're wasting our time. But he's not still in the tomb. That's the importance. Now, let me give you a little bit of background as to why the Greeks were dealing with it and why sometimes we deal with it. But here's one of the things the promise to tell you is that Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection. We are the first fruits. His had to take place first because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Now, in that culture, uh, the Greeks didn't like to talk about resurrection. They didn't, they didn't like that at all. You guys know why they didn't like that? Uh, in that culture, they had a hard time with, why would you want to be chained to this old, decrepit, worn-out, decaying body? Forever. And it's actually a, a pretty good premise, I think, because technically one of the reasons that, that the Lord brought <coughs> Adam and Eve from the garden so that they couldn't go eat from the tree of life in their corrupted body because he didn't want us to live in that corrupted body forever. He's going to make us new bodies. Paul's going to talk about that in this chapter. But in this particular sense, the Greek culture, they didn't want to think that they could be, would have to be chained to this body. They saw death as a release. Guess what? Death is a release from this body, but it's the destination is what is important. Um, but Paul wants to instruct them because not just the Greek culture, but guess what? Some of those in the Jewish culture were upsetting them because some of them said there is no such thing as resurrection. You guys will have heard of this group. They're called the Sadducees. The easiest way for you to remember them from the Pharisees is the Sadducees. The reason they were Sadducees is because they didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in the supernatural. Uh, they didn't study anything that Jesus said or that the Torah said because what does the Torah tell us? That there is not just this world that's very important. That God came from the world he was in into our world to make the way. That's part of the gospel message. All right, so here's the prerequisite as Paul talks about these things. He's going to talk about the fact of the resurrection, the order of the resurrection, and the mystery of Christ's resurrection. Why is it a mystery to us? This is the interactive part. It's okay for you all to speak. Why is, why is the Lord's resurrection a mystery to us? It's the same reason that often the Holy Spirit is a mystery to us. Why God's a mystery to us? Because it's supernatural. It's supernatural. It's not something that we can see. It's why faith is a mystery to us often. It's to the world in particular. It is, it is foolishness because faith is not something that you can grab onto, but you can see. You can't see it, but it's there. It's like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you know the wind is there. The resurrection, it's a mystery to us because we didn't see it, but we believe it. And one day, we'll see him the way he is. And in that time, it won't be looking like dimly through a mirror and all those other pictures that they, they took a, talked about. And we will be complete. And it won't be a mystery. And the cool thing is, is that the Lord holds us until we get to that point. We are hidden in Christ, y'all heard that terminology. That hidden doesn't mean we are a mystery of Christ. That means that he holds on, he knows where our salvation is, and he promises to hold it until we get there. Okay, so here's the prerequisite. You've got to know what the good news is. Anybody want to give me a crack at the good news? What is it? It's the gospel. It is the gospel. 
gospel. That's the easy one. The gospel, another word for it, is the good news. Here's the Greek, euangelion. Uh, there's going to be a spelling test, euangelion. Uh, literally, it means God's good news. Now, here's the secret about this. This is not just the gospel message. is not just the way to be saved. The gospel message is all of God's word taken together. It all works together. It's all of God's word it's taken not part together. Of it? It's not part of really? it. It's all of it. This is why in our watered-down culture, we have a hard time with repeat this prayer and you can be saved. And it doesn't include that second word, not just Savior, but Lord. Uh, because God's word includes both of those, that he is Lord and Savior. And we make that choice in this life, and part of the gospel message is, is that Jesus came so that we could freely make that choice and voluntarily we could live as that bond servant for him. Here's the thing. Most people aren't going to make that choice. But God's word is also clear that if they don't make that choice, at some point, all of us will do something. We'll all bow before Jesus. It will either be in uh, obedience or it will be in submission because the Lord has put all things under him. Uh, but that is the good news. That's the foundation. You have to know that. You have to be able to build on that. And it is Jesus Christ that he was. He is God's son, that he was born of a virgin who lived a perfect sin-free life, that uh, he, he committed no wrong, that he willingly paid the price that we could not pay, that he had God's wrath dumped out on him that belonged to me, that belonged to you. And he willingly did that. But that's not where it ended. They put him in the tomb three days later. This is what we're celebrating. If he didn't rise again, we're wasting our time. But he did rise again. And Paul, the one who's writing this message to him, is going to say, look, I'm one of those guys that I was, even though I was born a little bit out of time as far as being a disciple, that at the right time, I am an eyewitness, and you guys need to know this. Don't let strange doctrine, don't let other things, misunderstandings, take away from what the foundation is, that Jesus Christ lived, <coughs> he lived, he died, and he rose again, and he did it because he loves you, right? So that's the base that we got to build on, all right? 58 verses in this chapter, so y'all got to listen quick and get ready to move. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul's going to start with the fact of the resurrection. I'm going to try to go through this really, really quickly. You guys know if I go through this, we'll see a minor miracle right up there with God parting the Red Sea from us. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15.1. Now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also receive, in which you also stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. First line of evidence here. Let me just give it to you from an investigator standpoint. A dead Savior can't save you. A dead Savior can't save you. That's the first line of evidence. Jesus is alive. People there believe. People here believe. Paul is saying that. You guys have believed. I have seen him. I know he's alive. Uh, the guy who died got back up. And let your life be transformed by that. Don't let anybody change that for you. But because he got back up, guess what happens after you die in this life? You get back up. He's going to get you back up too. So you've got something to look forward to, not this life. You've got to look forward to the life that is to come. Okay. Uh, the next part of Paul's message was delivered, was prophesied, and handed down. Paul heard it, received it, and was transformed by it. So part of the next thing he's going to talk about is the prophecy of Jesus' life. Now, I'll tell you this. If you ever want to do an interesting study, uh, get prophecies about the Messiah, Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, get Google is amazing that they can print lists and stuff. Get them to print your list out. Get them to print verses out. And do a study about the prophecy, what it says, and how Jesus satisfied it. What I'll tell you is you're not going to be able to find one that Jesus didn't satisfy. That's a cool thing. And uh, I think math, statistic, all those people that can add numbers, I can't even say the word, so y'all just think of adding that number. Uh, they'll say that the odds of one person getting five of these right are astronomical. He got them all right. So let me just put it on the God level for you to be thinking about that. 
Second line of evidence that these things were prophesied in advance. Peter <coughs> quoted Psalm 16, uh, who was David, when he says, You will not allow your Holy One to see decay or corruption. He's talking about the son of David. Uh, what does that mean, decay or corruption? How long was Jesus in the tomb? Three days. How long was Lazarus in the tomb? Four days. What's the difference? The body starts breaking down. The body starts breaking down on the fourth day. Scientifically, you can go back and you can look at all these things. And by the way, science backs up everything about Christ as well. Just in case y'all need to know that, it backs it up as well. But one of the things that was prophesied in advance is that you will not allow your son to undergo decay. There's a second part of that that we're covering in 1 Peter. We're not necessarily covering it here. But he also went to the other round, and he made a proclamation. Uh, now, we don't know what the proclamation is, but let me give you my best crack at it. The last thing he said in this realm on the cross is what three words? To Stelestai. It is finished. That was the proclamation. Then he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost, right? Now, when he went down and gave the proclamation in the other, the, what I'm going to call the spirit realm, the unseen realm, guess what that proclamation probably was? It is finished. It is not a gospel message. It would be one to Satan and all of his demons to say, well, you guys tried to mess up. You didn't win. I've overcome it. You've lost. I have the victory. And all of those who die in advance of Christ dying on the cross, guess what? It's a proclamation to him is that I held you. Here you are. Cool things to be thinking of. But that's one of the things that was prophesied in advance. Jesus quoted Jonah as this because they asked him, we want to see a sign. And they said, you're not going to get a sign other than Jonah. What was the sign of Jonah? Three days in the well. <laughs> three days, three nights in the well. What did we see with Jesus? Again, you put the prophecy up with the end result in the tomb. Three days. <laughs> the belly of the well is empty, was empty. After that point, the tomb was empty. Again, uh, you have the evidence to look back. Okay, verse 3, for I handed down to you his first importance, which I also received, and here is the prophecy, and this is what you can base your faith in, that Christ died according to our, uh, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, third line of evidence you can throw out there, post-appearance, resurrection appearances. Paul lines out multiple eyewitnesses in the next set. You can do the numbers. You don't have uh, YouTube and social media and, and people live streaming, but you've got at one point more than 500 people who saw him alive. And, and actually when we get in there, some of them, it's after the points so that some of them have since passed. But literally Paul's saying, as a prosecutor, here are the people that I can bring into a courtroom and put in front of you as the jury and say, he's alive, here's how I know these people have all seen him and they all testify for you today. And Paul says, oh, by the way, I'm a eyewitness myself. Okay. Uh, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, by the way, before I skip by that, he appeared to Cephas individually, he appeared to Peter individually, and then later on, He's going to appear to Peter with the disciples. And at that time, it's right before his ascension. And what happens? He, they fish all night. And basically, he is going to ask Peter some very specific questions. And he is publicly restoring Peter. Yeah. Let me tell you what he did when he met with Peter individually. Is he privately restored him as well. Because he wanted to make sure his heart was ready. And then he wanted to make sure that those around him, their hearts were ready as well. That's what our God does. He... He knows us individually, and he knows us as a body as well. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once, most of them who remained until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's the brother of Jesus, then to all the disciples, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, that's Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and this grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of you, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. 
whether uh, then it was that I or they, so we preach, so you believe. Verse 12, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Now, again, he is addressing doctrinally the gospel faith message. That is, a, that is a given that you can't subtract. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, it takes away everything else. And he's asking, how can you preach that there is no resurrection from the dead? Verse uh, 13, but if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. If, in fact, they are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ only in this life, then we are above all people to be most pitied. And that's a true statement. And one of the things he's fixing to say, if that's the case, then eat, drink, and, and uh, what's the rest of that verse? Be and be married because tomorrow you die. And it's, it's a waste of time. Guess what? We can live our life and we can waste it. We can choose to waste it like that. Or we can choose to not do something that's in vain, but something that I'll say is in gain. And what is that? We can give our life back to the Lord. He has saved us and he has given us. He has purchased it back. Now we can choose to give it back to him. That is that daily dying to self. Not living for me, but daily living for him. It's a choice we make daily. Now... If we don't do that perfect every day, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna ask y'all because I know the answer for me. And I'm just gonna confess to you, Greg is not very good at this every day. I'm just gonna tell you that. Does that take away from my salvation? I'm asking y'all. No. How can I say that? Because I am not doing the works that equals up to what Jesus did. And I should be knowing that he's Lord and Savior. Because Jesus saved you, not your works. Yeah, because it was not my works that saved me. It was Jesus Christ and Him alone that saved me. And once I am held in His hand, nobody can pull me out. Now, as a child growing up in a family, I can choose to be obedient or not be obedient to my parents. If I'm obedient, it goes better for me than if I'm disobedient. Guess what? In our life individually, as we grow up in the Lord... Guess what obedience does? It brings about blessing. It brings about abundancy. Now, don't point to what the world's going to tell you that that means you get the best car and the best house and you have the most money and all those things because those are things. It brings you abundancy in the unseen things. It brings you abundancy in Christ our Lord. What do we know about that? Matthew 6.33. What does it say? Seeking with everything you got, what's going to happen? All these things that you need, I'm giving you the paraphrase by the way. All these things that you need, he's going to provide. He knows that we need shelter. He knows that we need clothes. He knows that we need food. We need to support our families and stuff like that. He says, you put me first, I got it. Seek me with everything you got. It's putting our heart in it. That's what he's after. He wants our heart. He doesn't want other things. He doesn't need the other things, but he wants our heart. Okay, what verse did I stop at? 20? Thank you. Um, three of you are listening. I appreciate that. Okay, the rest of you, let's catch back up. Okay, but salvation requires faith in Christ's purpose as lined out in the scripture in his resurrection. It is fact. Paul addressed some who question the resurrection. The fact is that if the resurrection didn't happen, your faith is useless. You are still a sinner, and people should pity you because of your wasted life. Uh, the gospel must include the completed work of Messiah. We can't take that away. We can't subtract from it. Ending with the Lord having all power and authority. Um, without the resurrection, you can't have the completed work. It's why it works for us as well that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You're not completed yet. Your work is not completed yet, but it will be. And that's where our hope is that on that day, then we will be made complete. 
but you uh, literally, without these completed work, here's what I said, you literally, you're at a dead end. Pun intended and no pun intended. Uh, but spoiler alert, the tomb is empty because the Lord is alive forevermore. Okay, verse 20. Paul's going to move into the order of the resurrection. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, he's referring to Adam as in the garden because Adam brought sin, Adam brought death. By a man also came the resurrection of the dead. He's talking about Jesus, referring to Jesus as the second Adam, that instead of death brings life. Verse 22, for as in Adam all died, but also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to he hands over the kingdom to our God and Father, and when he has uh, abolished all rules and all about power and all authority. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that should be abolished is death. Can you imagine a world, a time that we don't have to worry about our loved ones dying, we don't have to worry about getting sick, we don't have to worry about. Uh, the, the nature that we have. It's going to be made new. And we won't have to go through those things. Um, I love the verse. He is, you know, he has wiped away every tear from their eye. I, I lose my man card often and cry, so I'll just confess that to you guys this morning as well. My, my wife was kind enough to remind me that I cried at our wedding, but that's another story. Um, she should have been crying for a different reason, but she still cried anyway. <laughs> But I love the, the thought and the fact of that the, the joy, the peace is going to be of such a level that we have never been at that there's no need for those things anymore. There's no need to cry anymore. There's no need for tears. Um, for he has put all things in submission under his feet. But when he says all things are put into submission, it is clear that this excludes the Father who puts all things in submission to him. When all things are subject to him, him, then the Son himself uh, will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, and so God may be all in all. We've got the Trinity that's at work there. We have one God manifested as three persons. All three have an active, ongoing role, and they all point to that same moment in time when all things are made new. Because of Christ's resurrection, the sure resurrection of these who belong to Christ will follow. So you guys can take that to the bank. Go ahead, verse 29, i got to speed up. For otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? Now, he's, this is going to sound probably a little bit foreign to you. If it doesn't, it should. But let's read this and let's take it apart. If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized for them? Why are uh, also, or why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brothers and sisters, uh, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily. If from human motives I have fought with the beast of Ephesus, what good is it for me? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Okay, what's he talking about the people being baptized for the dead? And does that sound foreign to you? Yeah. It should sound a little bit foreign. In that culture, that's one of the things that they would do <laughs> is that they could be baptized for somebody that passed along. Uh, God's word and Paul is not supporting that. But he's trying to give them a picture that, okay, if you say that's the case, if Christ hasn't been raised, then what good are you doing by taking those steps? You're not doing any good. Baptism doesn't save you. What does it do? It's a good picture. It's a public picture. It's a personal declaration of faith from the person that is accepted for others to see. It's also something that our Lord said that we should do. It's an ordinance for us. But it does not save you. Um, I can't be baptized for somebody because it's their personal declaration. Now, how does somebody make a declaration? This is a statement about what I believe. What does that tell you? That they have to know that they can believe that, right? And so uh, if I was sprinkled as a baby, then that's not what baptism is. I'm just pointing to these things. Now, salvation is the same way. My parents having a faith and getting me in church, that does not save me. And I can't jump on the coattails of my dad, who was a deacon in the church forever, and say, I am saved because my dad had a faith. No. It is a personal belief. It is a 
personal acceptance. It's a personal thing between me and my Lord and Savior. That, again, that's the base. We've got to establish the base. Um, that culture, a lot of superstitions with the culture and stuff like that. And again, um, they were trying to do everything they could to, if somebody had passed on and they hadn't been baptized, they were trying to do everything they could to do it for them. And again, that's the that's the thing. The other part of the good news is it's given to us. We have that opportunity. If we choose not to in this life, guess what? You're past the point. There's nothing that anybody else can do for you because you have rejected. Um, Paul's point is plain. The pagans even believe in the resurrection because they baptize for the dead. The pagans have the sense to believe in the resurrection, but some of you Corinthian Christians don't because they're confused in there about what the resurrection is. Um, and, why, and then he goes into the point, why do I stand in jeopardy every hour? We know about Paul. Was he in jeopardy a lot? Chris, i got to really hurry up. Was he in jeopardy a lot? Yes. Uh, there's a list, if you want to see it, that talks about the shipwrecks, talks about the imprisonment, talks about the stonings, talks about the beatings, talks about the jailings, talks about the snake bites. I'm leaving stuff out. Ultimately, it talks about his head getting cut off. All of these things that people were trying to stop him, were trying to shut him up. And he's, he's basically telling them, look, if this stuff that I'm telling you is not true and didn't take place, why in the world am I putting myself at risk all the time? But because it is true, I want to put myself at risk because I lead, I point to the one who did all of this, for not just me, but for you as well. Key for us, most of us are concerned about living comfortable lives here on earth, and our life gives no evidence of the resurrection. Paul lived such a committed life, people could look at him and say there is no way that he would live like that unless there was a reward waiting on him in heaven. Um, one of the things you guys will hear in, in the near future, and I may not get all, it's okay, I don't get all the way through. One of the things you're going to hear in the near future, I'm going to talk about the thief on the cross that accepted. Um, he wasn't in any comfortable state. He was dying. He was in pain. He was hurting. He recognized who Jesus was. He recognized himself as a sinner. He had nothing to gain here. He, had, he could bring nothing to the table here. But he believed. And what did Jesus say? Say. We would say he was worthless, he brought nothing to the table, that he was the worst of the worst, by the way, God's word tells us that we all like that, we're the worst of the worst. And he has nothing that he can offer. Jesus says, I'll take you nothing, and I'm going to give you everything. And he testifies today, 2,000 years later, a life that was wasted, that was worthless, and he testifies today, 2,000 years later, that you, you do can be saved. I love that. Okay. Um, Yeah, okay, 33. I was trying to see if I need to cover a few more things. There's a whole Spurgeon's sermon in there for you to know, but I don't have time for it. But see you later. Uh, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Sober up morally and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. All right. We know that that's a, that's a principle. That, that's a principle that the world teaches as well. That uh, think of of a one bad apple, what does it do with the rest of the apples? One bad potato, what does it do? People are the same way, right? Uh, so he's talking about bad company corrupts good morals. Instead of morals, you could say habits. And then he says sober up morally. One way I'm going to tell you to say to remember that is use a clear mind to adjust your habits. In this passage, people are misleading them about the resurrection. And he's saying, look, that is corrupting you. It's taken away from the gospel message, the good news. you got to get rid of that. You've got to think with a clear, sober mind, and you got to fix those habits. And so don't hang out with people who are going to tell you that Jesus is not there. He's not alive. And, and he says, because some of these guys who are doing this, they have no knowledge of God. And say that to a shame because they were saved, and they should know that. But you know what? I can say that for us today as well. 
we are saved and we should know these things, do we? Now, I'm not, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody actually has to answer that. Do we know what's in God's Word? Can you say, I've been all the way through God's Word, cover to cover, even once in my life? Now, I'm, I, again, rhetorical question. I'm going to tell you, until I got a Bible app on my phone, I, I could tell you that I did that. Because I'm not a big reader, but I've been through it probably 35 times because of that app. And I'm going to tell you this. I don't care how you get into it. Get into it. And I don't care how you study it. Study it. But always check the context. Always check the content. Don't take my word for any of this stuff. And if you get into a hard passage that talks about Jesus going to make a proclamation to the spirit world. And you're like, what in the world does that mean? Don't shy away from it. Head it. Hit it. Head on. And let's talk about it. That's why I like our First Peter Bible study because we're literally going through one or two verses at a time because if we just pass all the way over it, I'll give you one no, I can't give you the one example, but I would like to give you one example about one verse that talks about what Jesus did. It's all the alls and the ones in that verse. It's the ones that he is. It's the alls that we are. And it's I use the three musketeers. It's all that. For, it's one for all and all for one. And it's literally, you could fill up a page. And if you just read that verse, you're not going to glean all that tell you. Stop, meditate, take it apart. Okay. Um, but some will say, how are the dead raised? This is verse 35. And with what kind of body did they come? He's fixing it. He's fixing to go through and talk about the foolishness. You fool. Uh, that which you sow does not come to us unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body uh, which is to be, but a bare grain, uh, perhaps a wheat or something else. But God gives it as a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds of the body to his own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of mankind, another flesh of animals, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly one is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. Verse 42. So also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there is a spiritual body also. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last Adam was a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual uh, is not the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the Spirit. That's why when Jesus said you've got to be born of water and the Spirit, he's talking about a physical birth and he's talking about a spiritual birth. The last Adam was the life-giving Spirit. I just read that, verse 47. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. As did the earthly one, so also are those who are earthly. And as the heavenly one, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. This old, feeble, corrupt body is not what you'll have when you get resurrected. You won't have to worry about Parkinson's. You won't have to worry about cancer. You won't have to worry about those type of things. It's part of how we live that abundant life now, knowing what is to come. And Paul would tell you that's the secret. Because what am I focused on? I'm not focused on the things that I'm looking at. And particularly if I'm looking at Greg and Mary. That scares me. I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the Lord. If I keep my focus on Him, then all these other things, the number one, are going to take care of themselves. And even if they don't, to die is gain, right? And that's the that's the view that He has. Uh, verse, uh, yeah, let's say 50. Now I tell you this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I am telling you a story, a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of the eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortability. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortability, then we will we come about the saying that is written, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks... Be to God who is, gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's coming. The Lord's given you a new heart. He's given you a spirit. 
He's given you his righteousness in exchange for his sin. One day he's going to give you that new, completely new, that new body. And that's the peace and assurance that we can have. And I'm going to leave you with this. Verse 58 is the key for us. It's the one to stand on if you like to make notes, underline, or start it. Here's the last verse. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And you guys know about the book of Ecclesiastes that uh, Solomon goes through everything in this life and he finds out, he comes to the conclusion, he reaches it with evidence that everything in this life, you can, you know, you can do that, is in vain. 